five, maybe ten minutes to the end of Goblet of Fire, because I completely forgot about the very end yesterday, um, or Tuesday. The end of the year feast is usually characterized by what? A warning of the house cup. It's a celebration. It's a party, essentially. This one's kind of a somber party, okay? Dumbledore begins it by essentially doing what? Raising a glass to Cedric Diggory, okay? And he says, and I don't know what page this is on because I'm reading it off my Kindle. Um, he says, Cedric was a person, but it's in the last chapter, A New Beginning. Cedric was a person who exemplified many of the qualities that distinguish Hufflepuff House. And he just says what those are. Good and loyal friend, hard worker, valued fair play. And then he goes on and says, and his death has affected you all. Now, a lot of people there think, how? How has Cedric's death affected me? How has it affected somebody, not Cho, but somebody in Ravenclaw, who maybe didn't even know Cedric? Well, he goes on. Cedric Diggory was murdered by Lord Voldemort. What has he just done? Uh, open up a bag of more can of worms. Open up a big can of worms. He said a name that nobody is supposed to name. That's probably the first time many of these students have even heard Voldemort's name. Okay? And then what does he do? He not only opens a can of worms, he rips the top off and dumps them all out. Because he says... The government doesn't want you to know any of what I'm about to tell you. How do you get anybody's attention? Reveal a secret. Okay. You say, what I'm about to give you is forbidden knowledge. And the ears perk up. So, he says, the Ministry of Magic does not wish me to tell you this. It's possible some of your parents will be horrified that I've done so. Why? Because either they will not believe that Lord Voldemort has returned, or they think I shouldn't tell you because you're so young. Okay, keep in mind, who are among his students age-wise? Yes, he does have 11-year-olds, some of whom may not have yet turned 12, but he also has 17-year-olds, and possibly even some 18-year-olds. Pretty much ready for the real truth. But he says... It's my belief that the truth is generally preferable to lies. What's he implying? You're going to be lied to. The government is going to lie to you, the ministry of magic. Okay? How? Because somebody is going to pretend that Cedric died as a result of an accident or source some sort of blunder of his own. In other words, if he weren't such a klutz, he'd still be alive. Well, what does that do to Cedric's memory? Tarnishes it, okay? So, everybody's looking at Dumbledore now. Malfoy and Crabbe and Goyle are whispering. And he says, uh, oh, and there's somebody else who needs to be mentioned in connection with Harry, Harry uh, with Cedric, Harry Potter. Harry's like, thanks. thanks. <laughs> now do I know to not only have all Hogwarts eyes on me, I've got all Durmstrang Bobaton. Harry Potter managed to escape Lord Voldemort, risked his own life to return Cedric's body to Hogwarts. Okay, what is he doing? What does everybody already think, or let me rephrase that. What does everybody already know about Harry? One, when he was a baby, what happened? Voldemort tried to kill him and couldn't. Okay, that's why he's got the scar on his head. Two, what happened first year? He defeated Voldemort again. And what does Dumbledore tell Harry when he's in the hospital wing? Of course it's a secret. So everybody knows. Okay? So everybody knows that he defeated Voldemort again. Chamber of Secrets? You think Fred and George really kept that a secret? Okay? So, what they already know about Harry... It's just being built up even more. What did all of Andrew say when Harry went to get his wand? 
Exactly. We must expect great things of you, Mr. Potter. So, he risked his own life to return Cedric's body to Hogwarts. Now, some people are probably thinking, like I would be, well, that was a damn cool thing to do. <laughs> Go back and get the body after you return. What else? He showed in every respect the sort of bravery that few wizards have ever shown in facing Lord Voldemort. And for this, I honor him. Okay. Now, does Dumbledore mean few wizards, literally, like half dozen? Who do we know, or do we know, of any wizards by name that have confronted Voldemort? Lily and James, and by name, Voldemort, excuse me, Dumbledore. McGonagall says, you're the only one he's ever really feared. Do we, does the public generally know that Snake turned traitor to Voldemort? No. Okay. Did Hagrid ever confront Voldemort? No. Did Sirius? No. As far as we know. Did Mad Eye Moody, the real one, not the, not as far as we know. So when he says few, he really means few. And how old was Harry when he did this? Fourteen. Okay. And Dumbledore says, and for this, I honor him. This is like having Jesus say, I honor you. I mean, because I'm not saying Dumbledore's Jesus, don't get me wrong, but his standing within the ministry and within the wizarding world, not just the English wizarding world, the entire wizarding world, okay, is so great. He turns to Harry, he raises his goblet. Everybody in the hall, well, with a few exceptions, turn and do the same. And then he goes on. The Triwizard Tournament's aim was to further promote magical understanding. Such ties are more important than ever before. <coughs> Why? Because Voldemort's now back. And he's going to go on and explain what that means. Every guest in this hall will be welcomed back here at any time should they wish to come. That is, all you Bobaton students, you ever want to come back? Open invitation. Durmstrang, you too. Notice Durmstrang doesn't have a headmaster. They're on their own. Uh, I guess Crumb's probably in charge. Because who's going to argue with them, you know? So he says, I say to you all once again, in the light of Lord Voldemort's return, he's repeating that again and again and again. Why? The authority of Dumbledore stands behind the assertion, Voldemort's back. He says, we are only as strong as we are united, as weak as we are divided. So, the more united we are, what? The stronger we are. The more divided we are, the weaker we are. Lord Voldemort's gift for spreading discord and enmity is very great. We can fight it only by showing an equally strong bond of friendship and trust. So, Voldy equals... He says, discord, essentially, and enmity, hatred. <coughs> Differences of habit and language are nothing at all if our aims are identical and our hearts are open. Dumbledore is not saying differences of language and habit mean nothing. He's not a quote-unquote open borders kind of person. He means differences of habit and language, that is, cultural differences, don't mean anything when. If we all have the same common goal. See, the, the European Union is built upon a myth. The myth is that Italians have the same goal as Germans. And Germans have the same goal as Austrians. And Austrians have the same goal as the Dutch. And the Dutch have the same goal as the Spaniards. The Spaniards have the same goal as the French. And the French have the same goal as the Poles. Okay? What's that goal? 
supposedly. The rise of the EU, that the EU will kind of counter the United States. That's why in the EU, they had it arranged such that, some of the countries are changing this now, such that you did have what are called open borders. You no longer had to have a passport or visa to go from France to Germany. Okay? Some of the countries of the EU, particularly the former Eastern Bloc countries, Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, etc., are starting to reinstitute borders. Okay? Why? Because the Czechs realize we want what's best for Czech. We want the Poles. We want what's best for Poland. Because guess what? What's best for Poland may not be what's best for the EU. What's Dumbledore saying? What's best for the entire magical community? Oppose Voldemort. So, if that's our goal, if we all oppose Voldemort, it doesn't matter what language we speak. It doesn't matter what our cultural differences are. But if we don't have that as our goal, and what did we see in the previous chapter? What does Fudge say? Can't be. He can't be. And he warns Dumbledore. I'm going back to the ministry. I'll be in touch with you tomorrow about the running of this school. Okay. So what do we see right there? Discord. They're not working in harmony. How the hell can Dumbledore expect Hogwarts, Bobaton, and Durmstrang to work in harmony? If you can't even get the English to work in harmony with each other. Okay? So, he says, it's my belief, never have I hoped that I'm, so, that I'm mistaken. We're all facing dark and difficult times. A new beginning. Some of you in this hall have already suffered directly at the hands of Lord Voldemort. Who? Harry. Ginny. So the Weasleys. Neville. And we're going to find out in this book some other folks. Susan Bones. Or is it Amelia? I always forget. It's Amelia Bones. Susan Bones is the one in charge of magical law enforcement. I might have that. <laughs> I always get those two confused. Anyways, one's the niece, one's the aunt. Where's the niece's parents? We're going to see them in a photograph. In here, they're dead. Why? Killed by Voldemort. There are other students like that. Is he only speaking to students? No, there's the staff also. Well, what staff member is not here right now? Who? Who left? The end of the previous chapter. Are you ready? Snape says, I am. Where'd Snape go? Back to Voldemort. When Voldemort said, one, I fear, has left our group forever. He will be killed. One is too cowardly to return. That's Karkaroff. The one that he thinks has left the group forever, that's Snape. And then Snape agrees to go back. Okay? If you remember in the previous book, what is the final evidence given to Fudge to prove Voldemort has returned? Snape goes up to, to Fudge and does this. See it? What is it? The dark mark. Every... Death Eater had a dark mark. Each one was a little bit different because you could distinguish the Death Eater by the dark mark. And he says, when Voldemort touched one, what did he do right after he comes back? Show me your arm, Wormtail. And he shows him that arm with the hand. Other one. Because it's the other one that has the dark mark. He presses it. Harry's head about explodes. But that's when they all, re all start reoperating. What does Snape tell Fudge? When he touched one, we were supposed to do what? Come immediately. Snape doesn't come immediately, does he? He waits a good couple hours. You can't apparate, disapparate directly from Hogwarts. He's got to leave Hogwarts grounds. But that doesn't take a couple hours. <laughs> All he has to do is walk down to the front gates. And then he can go. All right? So... Dumbledore goes on. I'm almost done with this. <coughs> Don't go away. 
So he says, many of our families have been torn asunder, his own included. A week ago, a student was taken from our midst. Remember Cedric. Remember, if the time should come when you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy, we re remember what happened to a boy who was good and kind and brave because he strayed across the path of Lord Voldemort. What choice did Cedric make that was between what is right and what is easy? And how did that result in his straying across the path of Lord Voldemort? What was the easy choice? Take it. What would have happened if he took the easy choice anyways? I think he still would have died. Yeah, he still would have died. I mean, Cedric was doomed from the beginning, well, so to speak. It was Harry that wanted to do it together, and he said, no, you take it. I think it would have been probably in his best interest for just Harry to take it. But Harry wanted Cedric to take it. He's like, you know, I'm not going to win any races. You're closer. But Cedric says no. Harry suggests, okay, we both take it. Hogwarts gets all the glory. We each get 500 bucks, essentially. Hufflepuff gets glory. Gryffindor gets glory. Notice what Harry's doing there. Sharing. Harry's had his share of glory, right? Okay. Remember what happened to a boy who was kind and good and brave. Why? Because he strayed across. What did Voldemort say just before Wormtail kills Cedric? The spare. the spare. In other words, he's not even needed. It's almost like if it doesn't work with Harry's blood, well, we've still got the other. Right? They then, in the school year, they hex Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle. Who hexes them? Harry, Ron, Hermione, Fred, George. Okay? There's Crabbe, Malfoy, and Goyle try to come in and warn Harry about, you know, spilling the beans, so to speak. So then we open this book, okay? What do we expect when this book begins? Whose mindset are we meant to kind of adopt as we read these novels? Harry's. We're reading it from Harry's perspective, for the most part, okay? What has Harry been told to believe? By Sirius? By Dumbledore? When Voldemort had his rise to power before, what was happening? People were dropping like flies, man, and disappearing. And we open this book, it's the middle of summer, and Harry's watching the evening news, he's reading the newspaper, and the Dursleys don't like this. Why? Because that's not natural for a teenager to be interested in the news. After all, Pages two and three, they talk about that. Vernon asks, where's Dunners? Petunia, at the Polkasses, he's got so many friends, he's so popular, Harry snorts with difficulty. Why? Because Harry knows what Dunners has been doing. And we get this description. The Dursleys really were astonished and stupid about their son, Dudley. They had swallowed all his dim-witted lies about having tea with a different member of his gang every night of the summer holiday. Harry knew perfectly well Dudley had not been to tea anywhere. He and his gang spent every evening, excuse me, vandalizing the play park. What else? Smoking on street corners. And throwing stones at passing cars and children. Throwing stones at passing cars. Is that innocent play? No. Okay. <clears throat> Harry had seen them at it during his evening walks around Little Winging. Why is Harry spending his evening walking around Little Winging, or whining or whinging, however you're supposed to pronounce a stupid name? Scavenging newspapers along the way. That's what he's doing. All right? So, Harry goes off because he gets in trouble with the Dursleys. And he goes off to the neighborhood park. Okay? In a lot of English towns, you'll have houses built around a central square. So you'll have row houses here, 
we'll have row houses here, row houses here, row houses here. So your roads go like that. And this will be a central garden or park. Often now, with locked gates. <laughs> and the only people who can get in are the people who live in one of these flats around the area who has the key to the gate. I know, because I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> so Harry goes down, and we're told, page 7, he thinks he hears a magical sound. Perhaps it hadn't been a magical sound after all. Perhaps he was so desperate for the tiniest sign of contact from the world to which he belonged that he was simply overreacting. Why? Why is he seeking contact with the world to which he belonged? He's completely in the dark. He doesn't know what's going on. Nobody's contacted him. Has he not gotten any letters from Ron and Hermione? He does. He does. But what kind of letters are they? Hey, how are you? Yeah, hey, how are you? We're fine here. Notice, we're. So they're together, not together, but they're at the same place. <laughs> Harry felt a dull sinking sensation in his stomach. And before he knew it, the feeling of hopelessness that had plagued him all summer rolled over him once again. Now, what is hopelessness? What's another word for that? Despair. Despair. Okay. He's thinking about the Daily Prophet. He's wondering why he keeps taking it. Because there's nothing in there. And he's wondering, when the idiots who ran the paper finally realized that Voldemort was back, it would be headline news. And that's all Harry cares about. So what are we told right there? What part of the Daily Prophet does he read? Top full. Top full. Yeah, he maybe doesn't even bend it over. Okay? And maybe the back, but he doesn't open it up. Okay? And he thinks of the letters that he does get from Ron and Hermione, page 9. I know this must be frustrating for you. Keep your nose clean. Everything will be okay. Be careful. Don't do anything rash. Next paragraph, right in the middle. Notice the words, how frustrated and angry <coughs> he felt. And then you get down to the bottom of that page. The last paragraph, the last five lines. In the meantime, he had nothing to look forward to but another restless, disturbed night. Because even when he escaped nightmares about Cedric, he had unsettling dreams about dark corridors, all finishing in dead ends and locked doors which he supposed had something to do with the trapped feeling he had when he was awake. The injustice, top of page 10, the injustice of it all welled up inside him so that he wanted to yell with fury. If it hadn't been for him, nobody would even have known Voldemort was back. We'll go back for a moment to page 8, bottom of the page. What are Ron and Hermione busy with? Why wasn't he, Harry, busy? Hadn't he proved himself capable of handling much more than they? Had they all forgotten what he'd done? What's Harry thinking about? It's kind of the why me, but it's the why me of, I've done all this great stuff. I defeated Voldemort, book one. I defeated Voldemort, book two. I defeated, not quite Voldemort, what, the Ministry of Magic? <laughs> Book three, I defeated Voldemort when he's fully back and in his body. Book four, Harry's thinking, I deserve to know. After all, what did Sirius say when they were at Ogsby? Okay, I'll try you. You want to be treated? Okay. Harry's thinking, what did Dumbledore say? He's done more than most wizards. And yet, now they don't trust him. Page 10, second paragraph towards the end. These furious thoughts whirl around in his head, and he does what? His insides writhe with anger. This is not a Harry Potter we've seen before, is it? We've never really seen Harry just boiling, ready to pop. Okay? Angsty teenagers. Angsty teenagers. Well, that's true. And he's got Cho on his mind, you know, ch -ch -ch. 
Just take care of Joe. Uh, page 11, middle of, the, middle of the page. Here he's at the park. He's sitting on a swing, and he hears Dudley and his friends. He's thinking, come on, here I am. Come on, look around. I'm sitting here all alone. Come, have a go. What does he mean? He wants to let out his anger on Doug, I almost said anger, on Dudley and his gang. What's he asking for? Yeah. Come, come on, come beat me up. If Dudley's friends saw him there, he'd be sure to make a beeline. Why? Because Dudley wouldn't want to lose face in front of a gang. But he'd be terrified at provoking Harry. Because Dudley knows something, Pierce Polkis and the others don't. It would be really fun to watch Dudley's dilemma. To taunt him, watch him, with him powerless to respond. And if any of the others tried hitting Harry, Harry was ready. He had his one. Let him try. He'd love to vent some of his frustration on the boys who had once made his life hell. What's Harry looking for? Here. He revenge. He was the next one. Yeah, or worse. <laughs> right? Why does he want revenge? Why is he feeling this way? Because he's got all that anger pent up and he can't release it. But they didn't turn around. They didn't see him. And they were almost back at the railings that is going out of the gate. Harry mastered the impulse to call after them. He mastered, I'll put an, impulse. What does this mean? What's he practice? Two words. Okay, restraint's one way of putting it. Yes. He practices self-control. Guess what? That is one of the major themes of this book. What happens in his first defense against the dark arts class with dear Dolores Jane Umbridge? Why? What does she say about Cedric Diggory? It was a tragic accident. Harry's like, oh. No, it wasn't. No. I was there. I saw it. He killed him. Detention. Okay. So here he gets sent where? In that chapter. He has a note in that chapter. He has a note to go see McGonagall. What does McGonagall tell him? Self-control. Harry, you must control yourself. Surely you know what Dolores Jane Umbridge is. No. You can never say surely and Harry in the same sentence. <laughs> He's not that... Use, and he apparently doesn't have a lot, okay? <laughs> Seeking a fight was not a smart move. He must not use magic. He would be risking expulsion again. Where did he risk it before? Technically book two, but it wasn't Harry doing magic in book two. It was Dobby. But then in book three, Aunt Marge, you know. And notice that. He blows her up. I mean, she doesn't, but she's big and she starts to float away. And what does Cornelius Fudge do when Harry finally sees him? It's okay, you know, circumstances change, Harry. Situations warrant. In other words, what does the law mean? Whatever the minister of magic wants it to mean. He can merely wave away little rules. So, Harry follows them. They all, the gang leaves, so there's just Dudley, and Harry's behind him. Bottom of page 12. Hey, Big D. Dudley turned. Oh, it's you. So how long you been Big D then? Shut it. Cool name. But you'll always be Ickle Diddykins to me. What's Harry doing? 
taunting him, mocking him, building up Dudley's own frustration. Why? What did he say? What were we told earlier? It would be nice for Harry to be able to what? Vent some of his frustration on the boys who had made his life hell. To vent his frustration means to release it, right? What's the purpose of a pensive? To take thoughts off your mind when your mind's full to be able to look at them later. Harry is using deadly, kind of, like a pensive. He's not taking his thoughts off his own mind and putting them on Dudley, however. This isn't a pensive because the P-E-N-S means thoughts. This is a, for lack of a better word, feeling sealed. What's he doing? He's transferring his anger, his frustration, where? Onto Dudley. Why? Because it makes Harry feel better. Does it relieve Harry's frustration? Is he just as frustrated after this as he was before? Yeah, he is. He's just doing what? Misery loves company. He's just making Dudley miserable too. So, Dudley says, shut it. Well, you don't tell your mom to shut her face. The effort of keeping himself from hitting Harry seemed to be demanding all his self-control. Dudley's practicing self-control. Is Harry? No. No. So who have you been beating up tonight? Another 10-year-old? I know you did Mark Evans two nights ago. Any significance to that name? Anybody else named Evans? Is this a relation? We're never told, right? Could it be a cousin of some sort? We're never told. I just think it's kind of coincidental that it's the name Evans. Anyways, notice what Harry's doing here. You've already said it. he's taunting Dudley. Where have we seen Harry taunted? Draco. Okay, Draco at times, but Draco usually gets what's coming back to him. Where do we see Harry taunted where Harry can't do anything in response? How about in the duel in Goblet of Fire? <clears throat> Voldemort crucios him. You don't like that, do you, Harry? You don't want me to do that again, do you, Harry? Notice the tables are kind of turned here. But Harry's playing the part of Voldemort. So Dudley says, yeah, but Mark Evans cheeked me. That is, you smarted off me. Really? He says, because if he said you look like a pig that's been talked to walking on its head, it's not cheek, Dad. You know, it's telling the truth. The muscle is twitching in Dudley's jaw. He's just... It gave Harry enormous satisfaction to know how furious he was making Dudley. Okay, how sick is that? To take satisfaction in somebody else's what? Is it, is it just fury and anger? What does the fury and anger create in Dudley? Discomfort. See, he's not making Dudley feel good. He's making Dudley feel bad. Is this similar to anything we've already seen? How about at the Quidditch World Cup? When you've got Death Eaters holding the Robertses up in the air, turning them up and down and round and around. Why? For their jollies. Harry's doing this to Dudley for his jollies. He felt as though, and here's the pensive image, he was siphoning off his own frustration into his cousin, the only outlet he had. In the book two, what does Dumbledore tell Harry the scar means? What did Voldemort do the night when he attempted to kill Harry? He, Dumbledore's words, Transferred some of his powers into you. Harry's words, Harry interprets that, 
He put a bit of himself into me? Dumbledore says yes. What's Harry doing here? Some of the same thing. Notice, he's transferring his power, his fury, his anger, his frustration, where? <clears throat> into Dudley. He's not, jump to the book seven, he's not horcruxing himself, however, to do it. Okay? Why is Harry like this? Louder? Okay. Why else? Okay. Why? He's been frustrated before and he hasn't let it out this way. He's been really frustrated before. Hasn't let it out this way. Could be part of the Voldemort coming out in his personality. Keep going. Voldemort's back, right? He's no longer this kind of inchoate presence. Now, he's really back, which means he has full-blown emotions. What did Dumbledore tell Harry about why his scar hurts? It's when either Voldemort is near or he's feeling really strong anger. Is Voldemort near physically right now to Harry? No. Is he feeling anger? He's Voldemort. Does he ever not feel anger? What's the opposite of anger? Happiness. Happiness? Is Voldemort ever happy? Does he walk around and sing, you know, don't do anything, just be happy? Does he walk around singing, you know, Pharrell's stupid song? <laughs> no! There's always this pent up <coughs> anger in him. So what's happening? It's siphoning. Because what do we discover later is an Harry, a Horcrux. So what does that mean? If Voldemort's angry, all of Voldemort is angry. That little bit of Voldemort that's in Harry is also angry. So they go off, head back to home, and the lights go out. Meaning, the stars go out, the moon goes out, metaphorically. Street lights all go out. Harry notices immediately what that means. Dudley's thinking, I'm going to take these things on, whatever they are. Harry just tells him to keep his mouth shut. Why? He was just getting ready to have Dudley. Come on, hit me so I can jump. He's protecting his enemy again. He doesn't want Dudley dead, or, to be more accurate, worse than dead. So, he fights off the Dementors, and we see Arabella Fig. And Harry's like, what? No, it can't be, not you. She walks them back to their house. Harry comes in. Dudley looks sick. And he gets a letter from the father Hopkirk telling him, you know, you're toast, man. Page 26, 27. You're going to be expelled. Your wand's going to be taken by the Ministry of Magic and broken, meaning you're going to become like Hagrid. You're not going to be able to use magic. You're not going to be able to go be with magical people anymore. And Harry's like, no, I'm going to go pack and get ready to leave. Okay? So he gets another owl, page 28, from Arthur Weasley, telling him what? Stay put. Dumbledore's trying to sort it all out. Don't do any more magic. Do not surrender your wand. Okay? Do not surrender your wand. There's a problem with that, right? What if the Aurors come to take it? Do not surrender means what? Fight. Resist. A small, page 29 at the top, shoot of hope burgeoned in Harry's chest. But he's thinking, okay, so how am I supposed to not surrender my wand and not do magic at the same time? You know, what am I supposed to do? Hide it? Okay. 
So here he tries to explain about the Dementors. Page 31. It wasn't me, he says to Vernon. It was a couple of Dementors. A couple, what's this, Codswallop? Dementors, Harry, you know, says. Two of them. But what are any other Dementors? They guard the wizard prison as command. And Petunia says. Okay. What are Dementors? Notice Harry breaks it down into those elements. What is a mentor? An ability to a teacher. A teacher, someone who builds you up, someone who helps you, someone who guides you, okay, in whatever you need help, guidance, teaching in. So a, because this means mind, okay, or agent of, actor of. So something, an agent of the mind. A D mentor is something that does what? Doesn't build up, doesn't encourage, doesn't guide, doesn't teach. It's the opposite. D teaches, D guides, D builds up. In other words, breaks down. Okay? And Aunt Petunia says they guard the wizard prison Azkaban. Harry, how do you know that? I heard that awful boy telling her about them years ago, she said. Harry, if you mean my mom and dad, why don't you just use their names? Because she doesn't mean his mom and dad. Harry thinks she does. What do we come to discover later? She's talking about Snape. Not James Potter. Harry was stunned. Notice this. For one, except for one outburst years ago, when, first book, in the course of which Aunt Petunia had screamed that Harry's mother had been a freak, he never met, heard her mention her sister. He was astounded that she had remembered this scrap of information about the magical world for so long, when she usually put all her energies into pretending it didn't exist. Okay? He gets another letter from the Ministry of Magic saying, you're not going to be expelled. You're going to have a trial. Your wand won't be taken from you. So Harry's like, okay, now I can at least sit down. Gets another letter from Sirius. And now Harry's angry, page 35. His temper is rising again. Wasn't anybody going to say, well done? <laughs> I mean, he fought off two Dementors. Yeah, but in book three, he fought off a hundred. Of course, he didn't realize it was him then. Well, part of him didn't realize it was him then. But. So, page 37. Vernon wants to know what these Dementi Wetsits are doing in Surrey. Harry, he must have sent them. Who? Lord Voldemort. Wait, wait, I heard that name before. He's the one who, yeah, murdered my parents. This page 37. But he's gone. The, the giant said so. He's back, Harry says. It felt very strange to be standing here in Aunt Petunia's surgically clean kitchen. Notice, <coughs> Aunt Petunia's surgically clean kitchen. Is that because Harry has a patriarchal mindset and only women belong in the kitchen? No. Why is it Aunt Petunia? Why is it in Uncle Vernon's kitchen? Or in the Dursley's kitchen? Maybe. Louder? No. She's the only one that is blood connected to Harry. See, Vernon isn't. Petunia is. Petunia is what? Harry's literal blood aunt. Okay? Vernon's just by marriage. It felt very strange to be standing here in Aunt Petunia's surgically clean kitchen, beside the top of the range fridge, the widescreen TV. Who has a widescreen TV in their kitchen? And talking calmly of Lord Voldemort to Uncle Vernon. The arrival of the Dementors in Little Winging seemed to have caused a breach in the great invisible wall that divided the relentlessly non magical world of Privet Drive and the world beyond. 
Notice what ruling has just done. Here is the muggle world. And the description Harry makes is here is the wizarding world. Or what does he call it? The world beyond. Kind of interesting. But he says it like suddenly now there's a doorway between the two. But that's not really what he's saying. He's saying it's like this. The two are one and the same, and what has happened? It's just now, this one has suddenly made itself apparent. This one can suddenly be seen, seemingly by whom? By muggles. Did Dudley see the Dementors? Not physically, but he had all the experiences of them. Harry's two lives had somehow become fused. Notice, magical life, muggle life, they're fused. Or, uh, this, one. this world and the world beyond have become what? Fused. Why? Because they always have been fused. It's just Harry's never realized it that way. He always thought they were two totally separate things. He's coming to realize they're not two totally separate things. Okay? They are one and the same. The Dursleys were asking for details about the magical world and Mrs. Fig knew Albus Dumbledore. The mentors were soaring around Little Wingy and he might never go back to Hogwarts. Aunt Petunia. Back? What do you mean, back? And we get this. She's looking at Harry as she had never looked at him before. And all of a sudden, for the first time in his life, Harry fully appreciated what? Aunt Petunia is his mother's sister. What does that mean? What did she say in book one? Now, of course I knew. My dreaded sister being what she was, coming up with frog spot, turning teacups into, you know. What does that mean? She was fully aware her sister was a witch from what age? Eleven on. Possibly even earlier, according to what we see in books six and seven, and it's even somewhat this one. Okay? So what does that mean? Do you think Petunia comes home from school, holidays, and, uh, excuse me, Lily comes home from Hogwarts and doesn't talk about Hogwarts at all with her sister? No, of course she does. Okay. He could not have said why this hit him so powerfully at this moment. All he knew was that he was not the only person in the room who had an inkling of what Lord Voldemort Dean back might mean. Why? Do you think Lily talked about Voldemort's rise to power? When did Voldemort rise to power? His first rise to power begins with the year Lily goes off to Hogwarts. The rise begins at the same time. She goes off at the age of 11. Okay. A few years, she meets James, she meets Snape, she and James become an item, they leave, they marry, and what happens? Ten years later, from her arrival, Voldemort is at his peak of power, and she gives birth to a little boy. Eleven years after her arrival, might have that off by one year. And what happens? He tries to kill Harry at the peak of his power. I don't know exactly what all that means, but it's got to be significant that his rise 
when he starts becoming famous, coincides with Lily and James starting at Hogwarts. And he starts to gather these people around him, Death Eaters and such, as they're going through school. Okay? Aunt Petunia had never in her life looked at him like that before. Her large pale eyes were not narrowed in dislike or anger. They were wide and fearful. This fu the furious pretense that Aunt Petunia had maintained all Harry's life, that there was no magic and no world other than the world she inhabited with Uncle Vernon, seemed to have fallen away. Notice, a pretense. Harry's thinking, she's been living a lie all these years. She knows what the other world is like. Not because she's been involved in it, but because... Her family was. Because remember, in that first outburst, she talks about how proud her parents were to find out Lily was a witch. Okay? So, what finally keeps them from kicking Harry out? Because Vernon wants, Vernon's thinking, he's back, he's after you, get out of my house. <laughs> You're bringing what? Danger to me and my family. Howler comes. And a voice says, remember my last, Petunia. And Harry kind of recognizes the voice, but he can't place it. So we get the advance guard. I'm going to skip a whole bunch. And the advance guard come, and they take Harry to where? The headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix. Number 12, pronounce the place. Grimald Place. But A U L D is not pronounced old. It's old. Grim Old Place. <laughs> and that's exactly what it is. Describe Sirius Black's house. Very musty, full of a bunch of dark artifacts. Musty, it's got dark art stuff. It's got a stairway with, you know, family portraits and one screaming old hag. Sirius' mother. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a row house. So it's multiple levels, but not very wide. Okay. So here he goes in. Who does he see? Who's at number 12, Grim Old Place? Who is at the headquarters of the Order of the Phoenix? And seemingly have been all summer. Ron and Hermione. So what does he do? He starts speaking in all caps. <laughs> he starts yelling at him. And Hermione's like, you know, get off our back, man. It's not our fault. Okay? So, he finds out about the row between Percy and his dad, how Percy is, has sided with the Ministry of Magic against the Weasleys, against Dumbledore. Okay? They tell Harry about what has happened with Dumbledore's reputation and stuff. And Hermione says, haven't you been reading the Daily Prophet? You know, the cover. Okay. So, we see Sirius again. Mundungus shows up. And we have the meeting around the table, which I'm going to jump to. Page 87, because I know we're supposed to be around page 290 by the end of today. <laughs> Before the children go off to bed, what does Sirius say? Page 87. Not just yet, Molly. And he looks at Harry. I'm surprised at you. I thought the first thing you do when you got here, start asking questions about Voldemort. Harry, I have been. Yeah, but who's he been asking? And what do they know? Diddly, man. They know nothing. Sirius is like, come on, Harry. You're smarter. If you want to know something about what's going on, who do you need to ask? <coughs> Me, Lupin, Arthur, Molly to some extent. So what happens between Sirius and Molly? They get into a pissing match, essentially. Over what? <laughs> who should be taking care of Harry? Who cares about Harry more? Molly thinks of herself as Lily too. 
<laughs> and Sirius thinks of himself as? Okay. Who finally decides that Harry gets to stay? It's Arthur. She's like, Arthur! <laughs> And he's like, you know, Harry's got a right to know, but we're not going to tell him everything because George and Fred are there, Ron and Hermione are there, Jenny's there. Notice, one of them does get sent up to bed. Jenny. Because what does Ron say? Harry's just going to tell us everything. What should Jenny say? Ditto. <laughs> but she doesn't think that. Okay? So... What does Sirius, by the way, say is one of the reasons Harry should be allowed to ask some questions? He's not a child. What else? Louder. He's been through more stuff than a lot of other. He's been through more stuff than a lot of other fully qualified wizards. What's he mean? Molly, he's done a whole lot more than you have. That's what he means. I mean, Dumbledore said that at the end of the last book. What does it also mean? He's done more than Sirius, Lupin, Arthur, because Harry's not, you know, playing around with plugs and stuff. Okay. So they tell Harry about Sirius, about Harry being discredited and Dumbledore, Dumbledore being discredited, all this kind of stuff. Does Dumbledore care about his reputation? No. Sorry, yeah, don't don't remove that, you know. <laughs> so we get the next chapter, the noble and most ancient house of black. And we meet creature, and we see them going about cleaning the house, and we see the black tapestry. This is one of the most coolest things at, at the Warner Brothers studio tour just outside London. Because they actually wove a real tapestry. It's about the size of that wall. The whole thing. And, and there are, you know, where Sirius's name is burned out, it's like somebody actually took, you know, a lighter to it and melted the fibers out, etc. I mean, it's really, really cool to see it up close and everything. So what does toujours pur mean? Always pure. Always pure. What does that tell us about the Black family? Are they ever going to be gray? <laughs> no. They will always be. So are they ever going to intermarry? No. They're only going to marry with other purebloods. All right? Yeah. And you get all the weird stuff, you know. So it's there, page 111. Harry finds out Sirius ran away from home. When he was 16. Why? He hated his home. His family's a bunch of, his mentality, not his words, a bunch of whack jobs. Who does he run away to? The Potters. The Potters. Zan, you got a look on your face. You have a look on my face. Why? Because that means that there are other Potters. No, 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 no. Who are the potters that Sirius runs away to? James's parents. I know, that's what I was talking about. Like, what about his parents? They're dead. Yeah. Yeah, James's parents, James's parents died. That's why when Harry looks in the mirror of Erised, he sees grandparents, uncles, etc., etc. Okay? So, what does this tell us about the potters? They're pretty cool. Okay, I mean, just take in your, your son's best friend seemingly without asking questions. Okay. Louder? Kind of like the Weasleys. The only difference being small family and probably somewhat well off. Okay. Because what does Harry have down in Green Guts? Pile of gold. Okay? <laughs> That's not from Sirius. That's from James and Lily. Okay? 
Did you say what James What did you do for No. Well, what did our what did um Vernon say? Unemployed. A layabout, a wastrel. We're never we're never told in these books what James and Lily did. I think it's implied James didn't do anything. Why? Because of his work with the Order of the Phoenix. That when he left Hogwarts, I mean, he and Lily marry very quickly. He's already kind of working with Dumbledore. Okay. Uh, the prophecy hasn't arrived yet when they leave. Prophecy doesn't come until it's either just before Lily gets pregnant or it's after she's pregnant. Okay. I think it's just before she's pregnant. So we meet a whole bunch of people on the tapestry. Okay. You know, Harry sees that Sirius, for example, and Tonks are related, and that Sirius and Bellatrix Lestrange and the Malfoys are all related. Okay. And he's like, you know, stop bringing it up, Harry. It's not like I can pick my family. <laughs> He's related to who else? Weasley. The Weasleys. Okay. So, Ministry of Magic. Harry has to go off for his trial. Mr. Weasley takes him. What does he see when he goes into the large open atrium area of the Ministry of Magic? Big old statue. What is in that statue? How, how is the statue, the sculpture designed? It's like a very tall, prominent wizard in the very center. There's like a, and then a proper, and then also a prominent witch kind of off her side. And there's, and lesser magical creatures into the centaur as a goblin. Okay. So, so kind of looking up. you've got the wizard holding his wand up. Figure of power. The witch kind of next to him, looking lovingly at him. And around them, lesser magical creatures. House elf, a goblin. I don't remember. Is there a centaur? Yeah, and a centaur. Okay. And we're told, you throw money in the fountain, and the money goes to St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries. And Harry thinks, if I'm not expelled, I'll put in ten galleons. So he goes off. Mr. Weasley takes him to where he thinks the trial is supposed to be, and he gets a message saying it's not there. Instead, where is it? What level is that? I had a student point this out because it hadn't registered with me. Um, yeah, it's way down. Let's see here. Um, we're told, and I did not take a note of the, down in old courtroom 10, I think it's down nine levels. It's like the ninth circle of Dante's hell, okay? So, Harry goes down there, and who all is part of the trial? Fudge is leading it. Umbridge, Bones. Bones, and Percy. And Percy. Okay. So we see Harry sitting at his table, page 138. Oh, it's Amelia Susan Bones. So I don't remember what the other Bones is at the school. So we have the notice interrogators, bottom of 138. Cornelius Oswald Fudge, Amelia Susan Bones, head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, Dolores Jane Umbridge, Senior Undersecretary to the Minister, and Court Scribe Percy Ignatius Weasley. And Dumbledore shows up. Witness for the defense, Albus Percival Wolfred Bryan Dumbledore. I've got more names than any of you. you know. <laughs> and he draws up a chair for himself and sits down. So how does the trial go? What does Dumbledore do? What's his purpose there? Kind of 
Harry's lawyer. Okay, Harry's lawyer, defense, etc. What else? How does he get Harry acquitted? What does he use? Uh, witness. Okay, he calls for a witness, Arabella Fig. What else does he use? Logic. He uses logic. If there were Dementors, and Dementors were in Surrey, Harry is allowed by the law to use magic even if it's in front of a muggle. That's one aspect of the logic he uses. But the other aspect of the logic he uses is what does um, Fudge keep saying about Dementors? They're under ministry control. So... If there were Dementors in Surrey, then what? Somebody in the ministry gave orders. So what has to be proved? Were there really Dementors there? Okay. So Harry describes what happens. And Arabella Fig describes what happens. And Amelia Susan Bowes is kind of like, you know, the description she gives is. But then she's also pretty impressed by Harry. Because he talks about, you know, I used a, a Patronus charm to just, excuse me, you produced a Patronus, yes. A corporeal Patronus, that is not some fuzzy, hazy, foggy thing, but an actual, yes. How long have you been doing this? Since my third year. What does Fudge say? It doesn't matter the quality of the, you know, magic. And she's kind of like, yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. So... He's acquitted. What does Dumbledore do? And Disappears. Okay. So, Harry and Mr. Weasley leave. And we see bottom of 153, top of 155. Cornelius Fudge, top of 155, was standing a few feet away from them talking quietly to a tall man with sleek blonde hair and a pointed pale face. The second man turned at the sound of their footsteps. Well, well, well. Patronus Potter. What does that really mean? Saint Potter. How is Harry a quote-unquote saint? What are, in the Christian tradition, what are saints supposed to do? So they like the apostles? They're, they protect. The apostles are all saints. Okay? But then you have other people who become saints after the apostles. They are people, other people, they're dead people, other people pray to. Why? Because the saints in the Christian tradition are where? In heaven, right in front of Jesus. Okay? And the idea is, you pray to the saint, and the saint prays to Jesus. Yeah, but the Protestant Reformation, which we're coming up to celebrate in just a few days, 500th anniversary, says what? Well, you don't have to pray to saints, you can pray straight to Jesus. Yet the Catholic and Orthodox tradition is, okay, so who's the greatest saint there is? Mary. What's her relation to Jesus? Mom, who better to appeal to somebody than say, um, can you ask your mom? <laughs> or can you ask your son? If you don't really know him all so well, go to mom. And mom will work it out for you, okay? Harry's kind of this, what? Protective figure, right? Where do we see it? Go all the way back to the first book. He is a Patronus of sorts. He's always protecting and saving people. To the point in here, Hermione's going to say at the end of the book, Harry, you know, you got a bit of a Messiah complex. I mean, you're walking around, you're thinking you got to save everybody. Well, in book seven, what's he called? <coughs> the Chosen One. Guess what that means? He's the Messiah. He's the chosen one. He's the anointed one. He's the Savior. It doesn't mean he's Jesus. Okay? 
He is a type, a stand-in, like Moses was, like David was, like Samson was, etc. Okay? So, Harry felt winded. The minister was just telling me about your lucky escape, Potter. Quite astonishing the way you continue to wriggle out of very tight holes. Snake-like, in fact. What does he mean? He knows. He knows why, because Voldemort's been talking. There's a connection between Harry and Voldemort. Okay? Harry, yeah, I'm good at escaping. Okay? Notice, notice what he means there. And I've seen you with your nice little white sheet, you know, burning your cross in the background. You know. <laughs> Harry, what are you doing here? When Malfoy asks Arthur, what are you doing here? Arthur says, I work here. <laughs> Harry, what are you doing here? Notice it's not Arthur who asks we, uh, Malfoy that. Okay. So, Harry leaves. They leave. They go back off to number 12, Grimmel Place. They throw a big party. And we find out what about Ron and Hermione. Get their school letters. They're prefect. And Harry's thinking, what the hell? Ron? A prefect? What is Dumbledore thinking, man? I mean, he's going off his rocker. And Moody shows Harry, I know we only got a couple minutes left, pages 173 and following. He says, Potter, come here, I've got something to show you. And he shows Harry an old picture. What's he think he's doing for Harry? Showing him something cool. Showing him something cool, man. This is, this, you'll like this, Harry. What's the picture of? A bunch of dead people. <laughs> Original Order of the Phoenix. Page 173. Moody, there's me. Hey, he looks pretty good, you know. There's Dumbledore, Daedalus Diggle, Marlene McKinnon, dead. So we have Moody, Albus Dumbledore, Hagrid, uh, excuse me, not Hagrid yet, Daedalus Diggle, and then we have Marlene McKinnon. Notice the red are dead. Okay. Marlene, Marlene McKinnon, she was killed two weeks after this was taken. They got her whole family. That's Frank and Alice. Let's put them over here. <laughs> Frank and Alice, because they may as well be dead, frankly. Harry's stomach churns. What else? We have Emmeline Vance. You've met her. There's Lupin. So Emmeline Vance, Remus Lupin. What's going to happen to Emily Vance next book? She's dead. Okay. Benji Fenwick. He's dead. Edgar Bones, brother of Amelia Bones. They got him and his family too. He's dead. Sturgis Podmore. He's still alive. Not for long. Caradoc Dearburn. Sorry, Sturgis Podmore. Um, Caradoc Dearburn disappeared, presumed dead. There's Hagrid and Elphias Doge, who we won't hear much of in Book 7. Gideon Pruitt took five Death Eaters to kill him and his brother Fabian. Who are they related to? Molly Weasley. They're her brothers. Well, yes. Okay. What else? Let's see here. There's Aberforth. He's still alive. And there is Dorcas Meadows. She's dead. And there's Sirius. And he's alive for now. <laughs> there's Wormtail. Okay. He's still alive. So, you have 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 people in the order. Yes. Lillian James, sorry. 20 people. Yeah, they're over here. Yeah, kind of. Okay. So you have 22 people. And of those 22, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 are dead. And 2 are quasi dead. So what does that mean? 50% of the original Order of the Phoenix are out of action. Not a good omen. Okay, we'll stop there, obviously. <laughs> Didn't get quite as far as I wanted to. Second, third, for Tuesday. Second, third for Tuesday.